how do we take something that's an up and coming trend and actually make it ours? And usually for us, that means like we're making it sleek, fashion forward, stylish. And not everything that's on trend is necessarily going to be a, a, a fit for us. You know, it's like the question is, OK, if, is it on trend? Is it is it something customers want? Does it make sense with our brand? Can we do it in a simple, modern way? I mean, those kind of things all get vetted. In 2016, I co-founded a drinkware company called Simple Modern. I was obsessed with the question, what would happen if we built a for-profit company focused on generosity? This podcast is a behind-the-scenes look at how we scaled from a bootstrapped startup to nine figures in annual revenue. We'll share with you the strategies we used, things learned along the way, and how we built a different type of company. This is Scaling for Good. Welcome back to Scaling for Good. I'm Mike Beckham, the co-founder and CEO of Simple Modern. If you're trying to build a brand, especially a brand in the consumer product space, product is the most important thing. Years ago, we started by selling our product on Amazon. And as you know, we all shop on Amazon. Product reviews are paramount in making purchasing decisions. Over the years, we've been fortunate to build a reputation as a company that has exceptionally high quality products, but at affordable prices. As you can imagine, that doesn't just happen. It takes a lot of deliberate thought and hard work behind the scenes. Today, I'm going to be joined by two of the people that have helped architect that success, Nathaniel Haskins, our general counsel, and Alex Benton, the vice president of international manufacturing and product development. Welcome to the show, guys. Hey, Thanks. Great to be here. Let's start here. How do we decide what new product categories we want to go after? I mean, it's evolved over time, which is a testament to our company, and we're just constantly learning and and growing and changing, willing to change the way we do things. Uh, Initially, it was more e-commerce focused, and it was we were looking at where's the e-commerce opportunity? Can we get um, visibility on Amazon and you know rise to the top and be competitive and and make a viable product? I think would be more of the focus. Um, it was, it, there was always a sense of like, does this make sense with drinkware and stuff? But, uh, a lot of it was really, I mean, we, we had the phrase Amazon first, or we, it was focused on, can we succeed in e-commerce? Um, there have been some product opportunities that it was very clear that, um, we could make the product uh, at least as good or better than what's on the market and do it less expensively and and make it look better. And and the just the prices that people were charging were so high that there was an easy slide in. There was a, there's a few products that have have that that has been the trajectory. Um but so those are kind of the first two uh, ways that we we decided products. And then over time it's become very much more we're building a brand, what does our customer want? And so we get surveys from customers, we get internal surveys and we decide you know, what makes sense with the brand and what is the customer telling us? And we go that direction. And so, yeah, as our, or as our brand has grown, our strategy has like continued to evolve, you know, even this year, like it, it continues to evolve. But I mean, I think we, we definitely think about, um, you know, our customers at the very beginning of this, we don't want to just design something that we like as enjoyable yeah, as that is, you know, exactly. like we could go do that. We could build something that like Nathaniel and I want to, use and we'd use it all the time but mm-hmm. we actually you know focus on our on our customers and and what they want so you got to start there and then work your way backwards um so there's a lot of um our team is very analytical so we're always like looking scrubbing data trying to yeah. find like where some of those opportunities are but you know i think we we do we want to earn that right with our customers to you know show them a new a new product um i recently learned like with Nike, like when they would go into a new sport, they would always start with, what do you guys think? Shoes. Shoes. Right. Yeah, sure. You know, it's yeah, like they're going to start with yeah. shoes. <laughs> yeah. So it's like they want to get into like lacrosse or something like that. Right. Nike's not going to go build a lacrosse stick. I don't know anything yeah, about Yeah, I don't lacrosse. know what that's so called. I should probably, probably, back, is, I should right. probably back out of any <laughs> lacrosse analogies, but like <laughs> they would start with shoes, like in whatever that sport is you know because they had they had earned that right you know Mm -hmm. um with uh shoes so that's how they'd approach it and so um you know i think for us like we try and think about it maybe in a similar way where it's like where are kind of the natural fits maybe it's an adjacent category and nathaniel and i were talking earlier about um you know one of our products that we launched this year was a a tote and it's a pretty fashionable 
type of yeah. item. And we've been trying to, you know, get traction in uh, adult textiles for quite some time. Um, and I think we've earned that right with our customers through like making very stylish, uh, fashionable drinkware products. Um, and so we've been able to kind of expand into some of those other adjacent categories as we've kind of focused on this is what we're like really good at. And, and we don't want to lose that focus um, ever. But so, yeah, I think those are a few things that kind of yeah. come to mind as we think about getting into new product yeah. categories. It's it's very collaborative too, I guess would be the other thing to discuss is it's, yeah. it's not, you know, it wasn't Nathaniel. It's not me sitting around thinking no. about this stuff. We work with our growth team. We work with our marketing team, our senior leadership team. Um, we're looking at all the data and looking at the market and certainly keeping an eye on our competitors and, and trends. And so, um, it's a very, um, robust kind of process. And then we try a lot of things yeah. too. We're not afraid to jump into something and make an investment uh, in it. And if it doesn't work, like we're okay. So are there a significant number of products that we have developed prototypes or molds that we never brought to market? Oh, Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when we were doing textiles initially in one year, I think we had made five lunch bags, five backpacks, three we sold, a fanny pack we never sold. Uh, you know, there's just, there was, and there, oh, there's one more, there's a travel bag too that we never yeah. sold. Like that's just in the textile space. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, there's always this tension of, we want to go after stuff and be aggressive, but it doesn't, sometimes we'll get into it and realize it doesn't work. And we've recently, we're working on a lid that, you know, it's like we were having issues with it and we, we said, okay, at what point, like we got to, we got to push this out. This isn't, we're not going to hit our deadlines. And at what point do we just say cut ties? This isn't going to work, you know? And so we're always having that tension of like trying to figure out, is this something we just need to keep iterating on until we can get it to work or is it just not going to make it? But. Yeah. It seems like one of the interesting dynamics is that when you're trying to be innovative and do something that no one else has done before, that's obviously harder. You've got a much longer development life cycle and much higher chance of failure, just not being able to make it yeah. work. So how do you balance that? How do you balance the desire to bring products to market and also to put our own particular brand on on a on an idea, um, in a way that's unique and differentiated, but also we'll, we'll actually come out of the pipeline and someday be sold because right. obviously we're not just, you know, it's not just a creative exercise where we're really trying to bring products to market. I think right now we're working on 50 plus products, you know, so don't that it, don't, seems like a lot. Don't don't if you're, list yeah. if you're listening right to this, that's absurd. That's an absurd it's, number it's, of products to be a, working on. Yeah, it's a lot. That's a bunch. We may see something that's like not on our roadmap, but it's like, this seems to be a trend, you know? Well then like, how do we take something that's an up and coming trend and actually make it ours? And usually for us, that means like we're making it sleek, uh, fashion forward, stylish, um, better functions, better features. Um, so those are yeah. some of the some of the things that we think about. Yeah, and not everything that's on trend is necessarily going to be a, a a fit for us. You know, it's like the question is, okay, if is it on trend? Is it is it something customers want? Does it make sense with our brand? Can we do it in a simple modern way? I mean, those kind of things all get vetted. So we might pass on opportunities too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one of the tensions is you're you're always trying to determine on a product, hey, what features is it going to have? What materials are we going to use? Mm-hmm. One of the ways that we've built this brand is by trying to fuse quality and affordable price. Mm-hmm. So how do you think through those trade-off decisions when you're looking at two different fabrics and one you feel like is a little bit nicer fabric, but maybe it costs 30% more or a feature that the customer, it might be a nice to have, but it's going to add 20 cents to your manufacturing cost. Yeah. How do you go through that process of determining what's in, what's out, and what's the final feature set of the product? Yeah, I'd say some of the bent has been to try to put everything we want to in a product initially if we can. Um, like Alex said earlier, and I mentioned too, like that the, we are very data driven. So a lot of times we'll be pulling either product reviews, looking at other products on the market, listening to what customers say they want in a product. Often we'll send a survey asking, not only do you want a tote, but what do you want the tote to have, for example? Um, and then list gathering all of that information. Uh, a lot of times it's clear these features need to be in a product. 
here are some complaints that people have had about the product. So the question is, can we fix those complaints? And then what other features would we add? Is there a way to improve it? Uh, and then is there, is there additional features that customers have asked us to put in it? And, you know, trying to put in all of that or take out what needs to be taken out and get all that compiled. And then, you know, then the question is, what have you built? Have you built a $500 bag or have you built a, you know, $20 bag? And then, you know, we go back to the data and say, okay, what do customers say they want to pay? What seems to be what the market's telling us that, that it wants to pay? Yeah. And then do we need to make trade-offs here? Mm-hmm. Do we need to like change the fabric or, take away a zipper. I mean, we're, we're talking in textiles, even though yeah. most of our stuff is drinkware, but it's like, you know, it's like, uh, what, what do we need to tweak to get to where we need to go if we need to? So the parameters are like, what do, what do we ask for? What do we know needs to be in a product? And then how much, how much do we want? What price points do we want? So to just to <clears throat> elaborate on that in drinkware, like what would be some of these different variables that could add or reduce costs that we might look at on a vessel? The first one so that comes to my mind is paint, like powder coating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, if, if we want to make this dishwasher safe, that's going to add to the price. And there's mm-hmm. a bunch of things like that. Anyway, Alex, you were saying some of the examples you see. Right. Yeah. Um, that's a good, that's a good call out. Sometimes our ornamentation is like can add one, two, even three dollars to mm-hmm. to our costs. Mm-hmm. So it's like, well, do we really um, want to build something we have to sell for twelve dollars more so that like it can have this particular look? And in some cases, we have done that because, like, our, our customers do want that, or it's on yeah. trend in the market, and like that's that's great. You know, we're always looking for like how can we do it in the most uh, cost effective way too. So, you know, with some of those examples, we would say, okay, maybe this thing has three different applications on it. What does it look like if it has two, and we can reduce the cost by a dollar, but it's just as durable, and the look is essentially, you know, the same. So it's like we right. want to look for those kind of opportunities so that we can pass on, you know, we never want to compromise on quality. We don't compromise on quality with our products, but we want to be thoughtful about, you know, how we, what we put into it, um, that we're not just adding on bells and whistles just to add it on so that we can, right. then we're just kind of passing on the cost to a customer. Um, so, you know, and, uh, drinkware and insulation. There's different things that you can do to reduce the cost, increase the cost, but it has no impact on the durability and the and the quality of our products, which we're really proud of. You know, I think in a lot yeah. of these comparison videos that we'll see, like we're consistently like um, coming out like on top as far as insulation is concerned. Um, so that's a, a quality yeah. thing. But when we're when we're developing something new, we are. We'll start with like a large feature set. You know, we'll look at everything that's in the market Mm -hmm. um, and say, okay, maybe there's like eight different features, you know, that we could do for a new water bottle. Yeah. Then we'll start scrubbing reviews. You know, we'll look at our reviews from previous products we've sold. We'll look at competitor reviews. We'll see like what are people really talking about, Um, you know, as people reach out to our customer experience team. We get so we get a lot of great information from from our customers too, mm-hmm. you know. So we may go into a product mm-hmm. even, and there's been times I think we've had a product and we thought this is what's really going to matter to someone, and then <laughs> on the backside you're like, oh, actually it was this thing that like really yeah. mattered to them, and and we're definitely not afraid to iterate and disrupt ourselves too. So it takes a little bit of the pressure off in one sense where it's like we're going to make a high quality product Mm -hmm. we're going to start with this feature set but if we find out that like what our customers actually want is this thing or they don't care about this other feature well we'll take that feature away if it can save us some costs and we can pass that value on to a customer and let's add on you know another feature that they that they may care about it feels like one of the things that we've gotten better at over the years is incorporating more and more customer feedback when we're actually in the development process, yeah. Yeah. having customers actually get their hands on prototypes because some of those things really get um, surfaced there, what you're talking about, Nathaniel. 100%. Because um, I'd like to think we have a really smart team and that we have good judgment. And I think uh, over the last several years, we've shown that we do, uh, but we still get it wrong sometimes. Like we think that uh, customers are really going to love a particular feature and and they don't notice it at all. Um, or that, you know, something else that we think is trivial ends up being, you know, a deal breaker for them if we're not including it. One uh, mm. thing that we talk about internally that I think is helpful if you're listening to this is that we have what we call the rule of four within the company, which is 
um, every time for every cent you add in cost to make something, to manufacture something, usually that's going to lead to four or five cents in increased retail cost. So um, it's easy to say, oh, well, it's just 10 cents more for that feature, but well, that might be 50 cents more to the customer. And then of course, when we're talking about features that cost 50 cents or a dollar to add, you're talking about multiple dollars for the customer when they're buying the product and that, and that matters. Mm -hmm. So uh, as you guys mentioned, another distinctive, I think that's really interesting about us we do enter product categories where we think about being innovative, but sometimes we'll enter a product category or a vertical just because we think we can make the same level of quality. We can just do it more affordably, which is yeah. another way to be disruptive um, and can be really effective. Yeah, 100%. So uh, one of the things that we do a lot of is working with overseas partners to develop and bring products to market. And uh, there are a lot of cultural differences, yeah. especially uh, between East and West. Uh, what have you guys learned about working with people from a different culture in developing products? You know, one thing that we think about a lot and talk about is just being relational over transactional with our partners. And, you know, this this gets back to like just more of our core values. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, everyone that we work with, we want to treat with respect and you know we yeah. want to value what their thoughts are how they even think about a product so i mean this is um a big difference i feel like is even how they'll go about solving a problem versus how we go about solving a problem what are some examples of that how how do they think about solving problems differently yeah i mean here's here's a story we could go into it's just a uh around here we'd say it's the uh, straw rework uh -huh. um <laughs> so we had um this was uh i guess the production of this particular lid started in 2020 and then we unearthed this problem in 2021 mm -hmm. um but what happened we we work with um we have a main supplier for our our drinkware and and we've really um, leaned into that relationship and um, it's been very, very fruitful for us. Yeah. Um, one of the things that, and they take a high level of kind of ownership in our products too, which is like, I think probably is unique, great. you know, Ostensibly, yeah, yeah, it's usually a really nice thing. This time yeah. it was not so nice. Um, <laughs> they, uh, basically had like one small thing with our lid that they thought we can make this change. It's going to help, uh, any small leaking issue that we had we didn't yeah. spoiler alert we didn't really have like a leaking issue with this <laughs> lid but it was like we can make this a little bit better um which is good and, you know we talk about like how do we improve you know our quality bit by bit and in, in each iteration but they did something that did not improve our product it actually made it much worse which <laughs> made it difficult to drink out of this lid um and <laughs> before we uncovered this they had actually produced around a million lids which just it seems I like mean, a problem. For, yeah, if you're listening, like I don't a million lids is just like impossible to kind of like. like how big of an area are we talking about? <laughs> yeah, if you yeah. if you put all these bottles in a room, how big a room are we talking about? I mean, I bet a million lids you'd lay them out and it'd like cover a football field or something. I don't like, know. You know, yeah, if probably. you're thinking about sea containers, it's like you know twenty sea containers. I don't like yeah. an unbelievable. So an amount enormous of lids. amount of problem product. Yes. Okay. Yeah. We did something that I don't think most companies would probably do, which yeah. is like we didn't like just totally burn it down with with this supplier, you know. Um we kind of knew their intention was to like help improve the product. They went about it the wrong way, you know, so there wasn't good communication, which um is probably one of the big learning things with working with someone overseas is like the communication is just going to be a challenge. You know, mm -hmm. so I think when I first started I spent um, you know, probably close to 300 hours, like trying to learn like a new language just to help with that a little yeah. bit, you know, and it, it, it does help. And I encourage anyone listening to like lean into that aspect of it, um, for sure. But so we work through, we decide we have to like actually rework all of these lids. Like we are not going to send them to our customers. Um, it wasn't like a, a recall issue at all. It just would have yeah. been a really, really poor experience for we think a pretty high percentage of, of these lids. So we basically took on this rework, hired, I don't know, do you remember 40, 50? Something like that. Yeah. Tim high Porter school aged high kids school, that college. wanted to help. Yeah. It was a summer. So that was helpful. You know, we were able to like find a bunch of college and high school students that didn't mind 
coming and working in a you know warehouse. hot warehouse. And oh, by the way, all of us were working in that warehouse all the time right. too. Which you actually know, is, is one not- of my favorite parts of the story <clears throat> that you know we didn't just throw money at the problem and we didn't respond poorly to the manufacturing partner, but right. it really we took an attitude of we're all in this together. Right. But it's like to do that to you know. 10,000 products is one thing. To do it to a million products is just a totally different ball. Well, and you have to explain kind of like for for people who weren't there, there was this little valve, this little silicon valve, and the only way – it needed to be replaced basically. Yeah, so yeah. the only way to get that out, yeah. if you can imagine, you, you had to take a toothpick and you had to put it through <laughs> a little bitty hole and pop the silicon valve yeah. out. And so the floor is just covered in. with yeah. literally hundreds of thousands of these black valves that we've popped out. And then you had to thread this new one in through this really small hole uh-huh. and, and kind of pop it into place. And so yeah. uh, it was not – it was some pretty intricate work over and over again. <laughs> For sure, yeah. Open up the pack, open up the carton, open up the box, pull the bottle out of the bubble wrap, oh take the lid off. But, you know, I mean, it was pretty wild. But <laughs> but we right. also like, I think mostly we maintain a pretty good attitude. I definitely yeah. had a bad attitude some of the some of the days <laughs> for sure. When I I'd, I'd get back to the house and be like, well, you know, because. I would like, you'd walk and you'd be pulling, you know, these boxes over to the tables for people to do it. And I'm like, I walked 15 miles today. <laughs> you know, like and no we kidding. Did, and we did one at 40th of the, the <laughs> right. list today. Yeah. You know, like, like, how many did we do number? today? Well, 12,000 oh or something. You're just like, oh yeah, my exactly. gosh. You know, like I, so, but. It was a great exercise for understanding the scale the company had grown to. Yeah. yeah. Like this is actually one of my things is that. Our brains are not really like caught up to the world that we live in. Like we know we live in like a a global kind of internet age and that there's billions of people in the world, but we don't really understand that. We don't really understand big numbers. We just know that they're big. And so you can say a million and I'd say, well, that sounds like a lot. You know, I know it's more than a hundred thousand, but I don't really have any, I've never been around a million of anything (laughs) before probably this, you know, experience. And then when you're actually around numbers this big, you realize just how like mind blowing it really is. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. It's almost inconceivable that we actually sell this much stuff and that we have this many customers. Oh, I know. Yeah. That's wild. So, but but we work, we work through this and, um, you know, our kind of response was, I think different than most people, you know, obviously we're, there's a high level of kind of frustration and like, how do we make this right? And that all those kind of conversations happened. It wasn't like, Hey, no big deal. Like we got it, you know, like, but um, I think the benefit that we actually saw from like sticking together, like yeah. showed a level of partnership with the supplier that, um, I think is pretty unique. And I mean, I would, I would encourage people that are starting out to think about it that way, be very intentional about who you, um, partner with the suppliers that you, that you have, make sure that you're kind of mm-hmm. aligned on, on values as best as you can. I know this is like a difficult thing because if you're working with an, an overseas partner, it's like you're very limited on the contact you have before you can, you know, right. begin like developing a product with them. But I think being very intentional and, and really playing the long game has has benefited us. I love the way we handled that because, I mean, if you, if you kind of step back a- after the frustration and the hard conversations, realize like, okay, we have a partner um, and they know what they're doing. They're highly competent. They were trying to improve something. They had bad communication, but the, the intention wasn't nefarious. I mean, they were yeah. trying to improve it. They have good ideas, you know, like, and it's probably helpful that you and I have no idea what we're doing when we came into our roles. Cause it's like, we're very teachable, <laughs> Alex and I, cause it's like, we're, we're constantly learning new things. And mm-hmm. it's like, they do, they have a lot of expertise. And so you can choose to say, Hey, you caused us a problem. We're parting ways or burned down the ship. Or you can say, listen, we, this is a good partnership. We believe that you're trying to help us we need to improve communication and we need to smooth out some stuff, but there's some things we can still really learn from you. And I think leaning into being collaborative and going deep with them and saying, let's be relational. And we want you to speak into our products if you think they can be improved, but just let us know so that we can yeah. kind of vet the issues. Um, it, it ultimately results in a better product for the customer and a long-term relationship. Yeah. And I think the the consistency is bit, like I cannot imagine actually going around and shopping yeah. price like every year like that. I know. Like um, 
finding someone who like and and their team being consistent too. I mean, I think this yeah. has been a lot of the secret sauce for us in some ways is like the team we work with hasn't really changed in yeah. the entire the entire time I've been here. I think they've added a person, you know, maybe added two people. Um, but like that consistency in the like communication, like the number of hours spent like like trying to find like common language around um, mm-hmm. something is is really yeah. really valuable. It's like you're saying this, and I actually know like what you mean because right. we spent hours and hours. Even though you're not it. using an English word, I would really associate with that. Thing. Right. I've learned over three years that when you say you know this word, what you really mean is this other concept. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And and like I'd say for anyone listening to, it's like this is an ongoing process. Like. Even mm-hmm. on our last trip, like every trip, we're talking about communication. How do we improve communication? Yeah. Like every single trip. So um, there's not like some moment that you like reach, you know, with it either. It's like you actually have to put in the really hard work of yeah. this like every single yeah. week, every single trip. I mean, like it is not it is not easy, but I, I, mm-hmm. I can't imagine having to do that. When we start working with like a new – um, factory partner, I'm like, okay, here we yeah, go. Like, I know. I've got to start this process over, you know, with, with them, like developing some kind of a, a common language. And, um, and frankly, it's like, it's just a lot of time and like we yeah. operate pretty lean here. So, you know, yeah. um, and if we're developing 50 products, like you can imagine, like, in a given week, all the conversations that, that need to happen to make sure that you're, that yeah. you're aligned. And really to get to that kind of scale, you have to be empowering your partners to yeah. make decisions yeah. and do things. Also, if every single small decision requires a sign off from the team in America, mm-hmm. you're just going to go so much slower. If right. you have to look at every sample, it, there is a, a piece of judgment and I think yeah. autonomy mm-hmm. that you have to get to a level of trust. And, and really that's the word I would use. McKinsey will say that's the most important thing in high performing organizations is the level of trust they have. And that's not just true inside of an organization. That's true with your customers. Brand mm-hmm. is really just a function of trust. And it's true of the partners that you work with. Yeah. The more they trust you, the more that they're going to lean in and the better work you're going to be able to do together. 100%. Yeah. So they feel part of the team. And if you think about I me, mean, we're inviting them to be part of the team, basically, instead of treating them like sort of somebody just to give us something and just kind of move on. You mm-hmm. know, it's just, and if you think about it, in my own life, like the deeper friendships, the ones I've had the longest, are more meaningful and more impactful. You invest in the relationships, mm-hmm. it pays off. Well, it just turns out it's true in business, too. Yeah. So, yeah, I didn't know. Today's episode is brought to you by The Van Group. About a year ago, we decided that it was time to update the Simple Modern website. We desired to create a look that elevated our brand while keeping a focus on performance and speed. We talked to many other business owners for a list of recommendations. After talking to several potential partners, we chose to work with The Van Group. Over the past several months, we've been working closely with The Van Team on building and launching our new website. To kick things off, the team at Van did a fantastic job of gathering our input and walking us through a proven process to build a winning product. In our experience, we've been impressed by the deep knowledge, creativity, and collaboration of their team. Once our new website launched, the team at Van worked tirelessly to address issues and make data-driven improvements. For all these reasons, I'm happy to advocate for the Van Group and their outstanding team. It might seem trivial, but I don't think that it is. One of the things we learned fairly early on is being generous when it came to the credit for the success that the company had had was a really huge motivation for partners. So we were very deliberate. I've seen both of you do this, uh, really our entire team, of when we're with external partners that have played a a key role, we love to give them credit for the success that we've had and how Mm -hmm. they've been a part of that, which I think it it builds more trust and and it does build enthusiasm where, you know, we're their favorite client to work with Mm -hmm. and we get priority in a lot of qualitative ways that are hard to, you know, write down on paper, but certainly add up over the years. Yeah. And they get excited about the success and the trajectory and where we're going. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think, during COVID is a good example of that for us with our manufacturing partners. 
Mm-hmm. Is, you know, when things are when things are tight. Now, hopefully, we don't have like you know pandemics just as a regular thing right. or anything. But when they're thinking about priority, like whose products are we going to put at the front of the line? Mm-hmm. You know, resource wise, like who who are we going to put our best engineers on? Like, what team are the best engineers going to go on? And when you have that priority, you you get the benefit of that, you know. Yeah. So it's we've we've seen that play out time and time again. Um, and so we just we continue to lean into the um, relational side of it. Just so something you guys touched on earlier, which I think is interesting, we want to be about continuously improving products, mm-hmm. but we make products for millions of people. And anytime mm-hmm. you change anything, <laughs> there is yeah. a risk, yeah. as you mentioned yeah. with the yeah. straw rework, there's this risk that yeah. it, you know, that customers like it worse or that you introduce some kind of a, you know, an issue that in the manufacturing process or, or in quality control or whatever else. And so how do you balance that? How do you balance the desire to constantly be making your products better but also when is good enough good enough yeah so we are 100 percent comfortable and go into this process knowing that we're going to disrupt ourselves it does i know on the operational side create a bit of a, a downstream um impact your inventory positions what you have in the warehouse i mean even little things like changing the carton quantity on a skew it's like oh my gosh like that's going to require <laughs> you know hours of conversation just for something yeah, little like right. that it's an act of congress yeah, just to you know yeah. do some of those things right yeah. but you know we're, i think we're constantly like in communication with our sales teams too you know i think the um the worst thing we can do is rest on our laurels yeah you know it's like wow this thing's great like it'll be great forever it's like there's too much competition yeah. out there. Like yeah. there's too many people that'll disrupt you if you don't disrupt yourself. Yeah. So if we're not thinking about it, you know, like right now people are maybe listening to this podcast or thinking I could go do that. Yeah. I think I could do better than Simple Modern. And we actually love having like good competitors and we have great competitors in our space. And that does really like drive us and help us keep focused um, yeah. and not lose our lose our way and think like we did it. You know, we made the world's most perfect water bottle. It's, yeah. Like, mission mission around, accomplished. Hang mission, the banner. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Drop yeah. the banner. Mission <laughs> accomplished. Like we actually probably do a poor job in a lot of ways celebrating some of the wins that we have, you know, because we're just kind of like, okay, on to the next one. You know right. what I mean? It's like maybe there's a high five or a fist bump or we hit some sales number on our on our website and we're standing around here on a Friday afternoon and it's like, Awesome. Man, God, that, that is so awesome. <laughs> and then you're immediately on to the next mm-hmm. thing. Yeah, and I, I'd say anytime we've launched something, product development usually know, well, always knows, uh, what are the risks? Like, are there things that we think customers, we're, we're not sure if customers are going to like or not like or want us to do differently? And we'll have already anticipated those. And so we launch a product and then we're keenly watching reviews. Oh. And, I mean, it used to be like it's got to at least be a four and a half or above star product, you know, now we we're more like shoot for like 4.8. Um, and, and it's like, we were watching the reviews come in and saying, okay, our customers, like the truck handle, for example, we made it ergonomic. It's got a bump in it. We were like, well, are they people going to like that bump? Or are they going to hold it with their hand in? And it's like not going to be comfortable. And like, so we're always looking at like, is this, is what we think is a win going to be interpreted as a win to a customer? And we always have a sort of a plan B if it's not. It's like, well, we're, we're going to pivot on that if, if we find out it's not that. And so we're constantly getting reviews uh, from either from our CX team or from like Amazon or a website um, and hearing, okay, is a customer telling us they, they wish this was a little bit different or they want something different? And then, and then being ready to pivot on that. Um, so mm-hmm. just constantly ready to disrupt ourselves and, and, and make something better based yeah. on I feedback. think it's a great point. You know, traditionally, CPG, the way it's worked is you come up with something that people like and then it's, hey, how do we make this as inexpensively as possible? How do we just cut cost, cut cost, cut cost right. and increase distribution? But we're going to do the same thing just mm-hmm. over and over and over again. And it really feels like to me that whether it's the internet or globalism or whatever else, that that model is not a workable model over the next 20, 30 years, that you have got Mm -hmm. to be continuously improving and innovating on your own products. Or like you said, you're going to get eaten alive by competition. Yeah. Yeah. 
So I want to transition a little bit uh, to some maybe higher level questions. The company obviously is unique in that we have a really distinctive mission statement. We exist to give generously. And I would love to hear from each of you, how do you, how have you done your job differently as a result of that mission statement? Has that caused you to lead and act differently in your role? I'd say for me, um, it, it just is a, it's a good reminder. I'm sort of naturally bent this way, but sometimes it's hard in business to, to keep the mindset. But it's really think about how your actions or what you're doing are going to be received from the customer or on the other end. How, or, or maybe say it this way, how, how would I want to be treated or how, what experience would I want to have? If I were the customer on this mm-hmm. end, and and I, I feel like that's what ultimately it's about. It's like I want the customer to feel like we've been generous to them, not just financially from like offering a good product, a good price, but like you know, like this is a thoughtful. Like people have put thought into design, functions, features, look, and mm-hmm. giving me it at a reasonable price. Like I'm not getting price gouged. I'm getting something cool. I'm getting something that meets my needs. I feel like. It almost feels like a gift. I mean, you're paying for it, but it's it's you're not feeling like you're just not feeling like you're overpaid. You feel like you're 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 you've been given something nice. Um, and I and I want people to experience that when I make products. And then when when customers either have a complaint or or a suggestion, I'm thinking, how, how would I want to handle this? Like, can we fix this for them so that they or or somebody else doesn't have this experience down the road? Yeah. So it just makes me want to focus on a customer centric. Yeah. Internal teams like uh, product dev, like has a mm. ton of internal collaboration that, that happens, you know, whether it's with sales team, planning, growth, the manufacturing team, there's a ton of collaboration that, that happens. And like Nathaniel and I have had difficult conversations, you know, um, through the years of like, Hey, this, you know, this happened, like it felt this way, like, I understand, you know, so we were like constantly yeah. working and thinking about like, how are we generous with each other? Um, with, uh, I'd love to hear you yeah. elaborate on that. So what you're saying basically is that even when you're having hard conversations, you're dealing with conflict, that yeah. you can approach that differently when you have this mindset of generosity. So uh, can you give us a concrete example of how you might approach a, a conflict conversation differently as a result? Yeah, I think uh, ultimately we lean into collaboration. So we're we're wanting people from all departments to communicate and to speak into things, which is a little bit unique because a lot of companies will silo. Um, the 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 danger sometimes can be that departments, if they're not communicating with each other, can disrupt each other. Mm-hmm. Um, and if that happens, um, believing the best, believing that we're all wanting the same goals, it's kind of like the example we were giving with China earlier about. You know, they just want to help. Same is true interdepartmentally. Like yeah. we all just want to help each other and believe the best, and then go to it and say, "Hey, I know we're just trying to help. What 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 are your goals? What do you need? How can I help you get there?" And and vice versa, and just make sure that the communication is clear. And I think a lot of those conflicts can come up around time. You know, yeah, so absolutely. That's, People that's, always are excited about new products, and they want them yeah. faster than you know. Right. I don't think there's ever been a product where we're like, "Oh, I'm surprised how quickly that went." You know, <laughs> right, right. Or if you get like an early version of something. I mean, we we know pretty quick. Like that day, if we get something into the office, it's like that thing is awesome. Yeah. Like that is going to be a fantastic product. Yeah. And then uh, the sales side of the organization, which is pulling this and is good, is kind of like, yeah. could I order that like in yeah. two weeks? They immediately want to show that yeah. to a buyer. Right. You know, the e-com team is excited. Everybody is dreaming about the ways we're going to sell the product. Yeah. And you're like, guys, that was a prototype. We haven't even started the tooling <laughs> yeah. for yeah, it. Product right. dev hadn't signed off. And yeah, right, exactly. Right. right. But it's an ongoing thing, you know, so even internally, that communication and that like conflict, yeah. it's like those things are going to happen, you know, right. when you're when you're part of a group that's driven and motivated to grow the organization, like those conflicts are going to happen. So being generous, like with our interpretations of people, you know, we can get into sticky spots where we're like, well, they're just wanting you know, the credit for this thing, or they're just wanting, you know, we can, yeah. we have a narrative that we can spin in our head, um, where we start, you know, trying to judge like what someone else is thinking or what their motivations yeah. are. And that always gets into like icky territory, really. Yeah. It's like, no, like Nathaniel and I have had a conversation where we sit down and we talk through it and it's like, oh no, actually we're actually on the same page here we're yeah. just like operating on maybe like a different timeline you know well one of the points exactly. i think you're making is 
even being proactive in addressing conflict is a huge tailwind for a team that yeah. instead of letting it fester when you do feel some frustration, actually having that conversation, even if it is a little bit uncomfortable, leads to a lot more trust and a much more cohesive team. Yeah. Okay. So to transition sure. a little bit, yeah. uh, I want to hear from each of you, what are a couple of your favorite memories from your time at the company and or specifically working sure. in product development? Sure. Yeah, I would say one of my favorite memories is a bit of a stressful time, but it was in 2019, I think, right before COVID. Um, but uh, two of us in product development spent seven trips in China in one year and made all the textiles I, m I mentioned earlier, like the five backpacks, a travel bag, five lunch bag. I mean, just you know, like 12 to 15 textile products, not all of them we launched, but it was just that time of like finding a partner, going deep with that partner, really learning about textiles, like just pursuing and digging into another area that, um, I just, I look back with a lot of fondness. It was stressful, but it was, it was a lot of fun and exciting to, to, to just get a, a, a new, get into a new category, learn new things. Uh, and, and that particular factory come, came last, last week or a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't seen them since COVID. And it was just, there was a friendship developed too. Yeah. Um, so that was just a sweet uh, memory. Just what is the that, craziest you know, new food that you ate <laughs> during, uh, these seven trips to China? Uh, Frog legs or fish eyes, something, something in that. <laughs> fish eyes. What's yeah. what's the appropriate serving of fish eyes? How uh, many fish eyes? Yeah, zero yeah. fish eyes. Zero is the right, the right answer right. for sure. Right. Yeah. Number. So I think one memory for me um, that that kind of stands out is some of the uh, banquets that we mm -hmm. that we have. Yeah. Um, so for our main drinkware supplier, every fall we do a uh, banquet for them where we bring in all of the factory workers. Um, we uh, have a nice meal for them. We play games. It's just like a fun memory that, that um, we've made kind of externally with, with our, uh, with our partners. Yeah, there. It's like these banquets and we'll give them a gift and, you know, you've got um, like five people there can, can speak English. And so like, but you're going up and you're trying to express your gratitude for all the work that they're doing. Um, and so that's a, that's a fun kind of external, um, is that kind memory. of thing common, Alex? That kind no, of no. Um, and, and after the last one, I, I asked like, do the, do the factory workers even care about this? You know, mm -hmm. like to us, it feels like this is like a way yeah. we can express our, our gratitude to you all, like in, a way we don't know how to like do, do they appreciate this and and the people that we work with like basically said yes they they really really appreciate it they think that no one has ever done this before and they think no one will ever do it again mm. and you're kind of like whoa okay like yeah that's pretty wild to think about that something as you know small to us is like let's like have yeah. dinner together and let's play some games is like a meaning, a very meaningful thing. It's like that going and like shaking their hand and saying, thank you. I appreciate you. It's uh -huh. just, it, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing. Super valuable. And these are the people that every day that work are yeah. on the front lines of actually making our product and making sure that the high, it's the highest quality and the defects yeah. don't get through. And so, right. yeah, it's not just executives. It's like people on the line. You know? Yeah. So for each of you, you've been here for several years, and one of the things that's a common thread really among uh, the leadership here is that I think we all intend to do this for the, the vast majority of our career, maybe uh, for the duration of our um, kind of full-time working years. Yeah. So why? why? Why are you excited about the future of the company? What, what gets you excited to, you know, and motivated? We've, we've had a lot of success. Mm -hmm. What continues to drive you? On, on the business side, like having some of those really great competitors is like a motivating force, I know, for, for me. You know, it's like I want us to be the best drinkware company in the world. Yeah, that's, that's what I want to do. And to get to accomplish and have that kind of goal working alongside an amazing group of people that share values mm -hmm. is just like – yeah. I feel like we've kind of hit the the jackpot here um, with with where we're at. You know, it's like mm -hmm. we get 
We get to work with great people of high character. We're in a growing uh, market. There's lots of white space for us to move into. The future's kind of unknown. Like we get to, you know, help be a part of writing kind of the future. Yeah. You know, I think the nightmare scenario for me is like, you're going to be doing this one thing for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. And, you know. Straw lid rework for the rest of your life. Straw lid rework for the rest of your life. Yeah. Yeah, that was great for a couple of months. <laughs> great for a couple of months. And by great, uh, you mean by the second day you were ready to be done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but I think as we like think about products and like yeah. earning the right, you know, with different customers, growing our yeah. customer base, like that's highly, highly motivating. And to be able to do that through like, Developing a product that people mm-hmm. love, that they want to carry around, that they're proud to carry around with them. I mean, that's just so cool. You know, we have our yeah. In the Wild channel. Yeah, explain on, what the In the Slack. Wild channel yeah. is. <laughs> so we have a channel on Slack um, that's called hashtag In the Wild. And early on, it was like, if you saw one of our water, bo- water bottles or tumblers anywhere, it was like, noteworthy you know sure now like you see one around town and you're kind of like well of course you see one here or whatever but basically the in the wild channel is like you post a picture of our water bottle that isn't one like we're carrying around you know it's like yeah. wow there's a we have a customer you know it's kind of the <laughs> initial like thought the behind airport. it yeah. yeah exactly um but now it's like it, it's gotten more exotic like, exotic and Either esoteric a notable person totally. or a unit that we only made a little bit of yes. or it's yeah. in a very bizarre placement right you're on exactly. tv you know we've had tons of bottles show up on a tv show and they're like did you right. did we give this to someone I'm like no you know? yeah and so yeah um, that's the in the wild channel. It is fun seeing yeah. something you have created yeah. just kind of take on a life of its own. And I think it's actually one of the both challenging and exciting things about creating things is that you do have to kind of release them and then let people, yeah. you know, let the kind of the public do with it what they want to. Right. But it it is incredibly gratifying when you're like, man, we spent, you know, I like some of our lids. I'm like, I tested 5,000 of that lid. You know, I I drank way too much water one summer trying to get that lid just right. And now we make 4 million of that lid. And so when I see it in public and I know that, hey, all of that work and effort really impacted, like I don't even know how many millions of hours of people drinking Mm -hmm. water has been impacted by the work we did on that particular lid. But it's pretty motivating because it really mattered to people. One of the stories, uh, you guys know, I've, I've shared this story internally, but I... Um, taught a class with someone else for several years at OU. And during COVID, she moved back to Florida. Her father got cancer and we would correspond. Uh, One night she sent me a text saying that her dad had had passed away. Um, But she said, I just want to share a quick story with you. When he was doing chemo near the end, he really couldn't drink water, but he's parched, you know, because he's going Mm. through chemo. And we tried all kinds of things. The only thing that we found that could work was he could drink out of your kid's straw lid for some reason. Mm. And, you know, you might not consider this a big thing, but it was a big thing to our family that in my dad's last two really two weeks, he got a lot of relief from the fact that you built a straw lid that he could drink out of. And, you know, you never you never think about those things when you're designing a product. Yeah. But it's so meaningful when you get that feedback and realize like, hey, the work that I'm doing here and the deliberateness mm-hmm. actually impacts people's lives yeah. In, a, yeah. in a tangible way every single day. Yeah, yeah I love that story. Okay, so – uh, last question. What's one product you're particularly proud of that we've made and why? Trek or tote? Just kind of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Trek feels like the uh, easy one probably. Easy, low hanging yeah. fruit. Yeah. I'll maybe just say, but we can talk about both real quick. Uh, I'll be, so the tote is just an, is a, there was just a lot of evolution between the tote. We, it mm-hmm. came on the heels of like, we went into adult backpacks and they didn't go as well as we'd hoped, you know, and that, that that's going to happen. And we had the courage as a company to go into another bag based on company feedback for adults. And then we went in, we had you know, almost no features to a lot of features to where <laughs> we went. I mean, we've gone through a lot of iterations. There were a lot of trade-off decisions. A lot of trade-off decisions. Product. There were, there was a ton of customer feedback. We had internal surveys. We tried different materials. And I feel like it's it's kind of a product of we, we've we done textiles. We, we learned from what we learned from the first textiles. We did it better and we came with a great product and I'm excited to see where that goes. And then 
the track's a pretty easy one, I think. Yeah, the um, the track definitely stands out. But it also highlights, I think, the collaboration piece as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one feature on the track that we ended up changing very late in the uh, development of it was the handle and making a more kind of ergonomic um, yeah. handle. And that was based from kind of internal feedback that the that the team game gave um, very, very late. It was like, we're ready to buy this mm-hmm. thing to like, wait, let's actually, wait, yeah. let's make that change to the, to the handle. Yeah. Um, and we'll delay the launch of it by 30 days. Yeah. Um, and that's to, how the sausage really it. gets made. Right. It's, Hey, when do you stop tweaking? Mm-hmm. When do you stop trying to make improvements and say, this yeah. is ready to go. And, uh, it's not easy to make not those easy. decisions. And there's not a formula. I think you right. can really follow with it. You know, you just have to, that's where the, I think intuition comes in and, yeah. and then valuing the collaboration and, you know, so absolutely. And then even on that, and, and as with the design of the track itself, it's like the question is, well, we know our customers want a lot of water and they want to handle like that seems to be something we're at being asked for. How do we put the simple modern soul into it? Like we, we looked at it and like, we're thinking about the shape, like how do we give it a classic feel and, a, or, and, or, and, or a little bit of a cruiser feel, but, but keep it slim and uniquely simple modern and make it something that's aesthetically pleasing. And it, for a cup that's going to be big and a little bit, I mean, it's, it's kind of clunky or big or it could be. We made it sleek and kept that like classic, mm-hmm. simple, modern look. Um, it, we just, I feel like we put our soul into to the product and yeah. it's, it's resonating. People really like the look of it. Well, I appreciate you guys joining me. Uh, I think that it definitely comes through the intentionality and the care you give towards designing products. It's not a surprise that we've been able to design exceptional products. Well, thanks for joining us. That's it for another episode of Scaling for Good. 